Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Institute of uh, International European Affairs. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers, all of you in attendance, and everyone online. Um, my name is Donald Ryan. I'm Chief Economist here. I'd uh, also like to thank the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment and Enterprise Ireland, who are partnering with us for this event, and thank my colleagues uh, who've done all the hard work in setting up this stellar lineup of speakers for today. So let's uh, get underway. We've got an hour, five speakers, and, and lots, lots to discuss as we were doing during, during over over lunch. We hardly got through um, half of the thing, but I made two pages of notes um, in that short lunch. Uh, so plenty to 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 do. Let me just uh, hand over to Pascal Leardini, who's the chair of the European Strategy and Policy Analysts, and Deputy Secretary General and Chief Operating Officer. Of the You're very welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Very well, thank you. Okay. It's a great pleasure to join you, and I'm sorry not to be in Dublin today, but you may know that we are in the middle of the earrings of the commissioner-designate for the new commission, and it's quite an hectic, uh, hectic period for me. So let me start by congratulating you on the very impressive work you do at the Institute. And I know the different workshops and sessions you organize in the future of Europe and uh, we appreciate that very much. The futures of Europe and of Ireland are inextricably linked, and so the trends we see around us today are impacting on all of us. The topic for today is very timely, as it comes at the beginning of a new political uh, cycle for us uh, in Europe. After the European election, there have been the appointment of the new president of the European Council, and as I said, we are in the middle and hopefully in the last stage of the appointment procedure of the new European Commission, which should start its uh, a new mandate on the 1st of December. As the Chair said, in, in addition to my job uh, as Deputy Secretary General of the Commission, I'm currently adding ESPAS, which is uh, the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System, ESPAS is a forum for informal uh, cooperation on strategic foresight, uh, bringing together nine EU institutions and, and bodies. Every five years, it produces a, an important report, which is called the Global Trends Report. That's it, and it's available online. I'm sure you will uh, have it easily. And this is meant to sort of uh, prepare the new leadership of Europe by giving them a sort of the big highlights of what is coming ahead. The last report was published in May 2024, and it's one, ESPAS is just one among different elements of uh, focusing more and more our European system on foresight. For instance, we also have a very good cooperation between the European Commission and the Member States via the EU-wide foresight network, which works at two levels, uh, the ministers of the future and the senior officials from national administrations. Today, I want to focus on the latest Global Trends report that I mentioned and give you a few highlights. The report focuses on 10 global trends that we believe can have the most impact on the Union and its member states in the coming 10 to 15 years. Then it moves to defining some of the strategic choices and questions that the upcoming leadership of the European institution will face. They cover five interlinked domains, geopolitics, the environment, the economy, technology, and social well-being. The report doesn't aim to prescribe specific political choices or policy choices, but we do see a number of strategic questions that the report raises, and uh, we are very pleased to see that some of the questions which were raised in the Global Trend Report are reflected in the strategic agenda of the European Council and in the political guidelines of the new European Commission. For example, a new plan for Europe uh, sustainable competitiveness following the Draghi and Letta reports, we can talk about later in the debate, and the role of technology and innovation in that context. How did we approach building the report? Let me give you an example by zooming on technology. There are two phases. First, the analytical phase, and then moving from ideas to shaping policies, exactly the motto of the Institute. So first, the analytical part. 
uh, on, on technology, we looked at it on the deployment and the adoption of new technologies. And we, it's, it's, it's quite obvious, but there is an acceleration of the development of, and deployment of these new technologies. But maybe what is new is this across domain, across uh, areas like digital, biotech, next generation materials and clean technology. The acceleration is driven by research and innovation, economic and geopolitical ambitions and political choices. Second, we are seeing an increase in the conversions, which is a closer integration of sectors, products, services, technologies, which is fueled by hyper-connectivity. Hyper From that analysis, we draw some opportunities and risks and downsides. On the opportunities, for example, we see that AI has the potential both to give a serious impetus to growth and productivity and to drive forward the green transition. In biotech, for example, there is a potential for transforming food value chains. The fusion of AI and quantum computing is likely to revolutionize science. At the same time, there are risks and downsides. For example, an extreme risk is that the AI is taking over and provoking real life catastrophes. New technologies are likely to be misused by some actors. Our ability to discern the truth could be further undermined, corroding trust in society and institutions. Also, new technologies are often energy incentive, intensive, sorry, with the digital sector alone responsible today for 5 to 10% of global electricity use, and their share is likely to grow in the future. That's for the analytical part in, in very brief uh, terms. But with this strategy, foresight approach, we don't stop at that level. We also try to uh, look at the policy implications and what does it mean for the decision makers. For technology, again, the strategic question is about how to frame the tech right. You may have seen that in the mandate of a new executive vice president of, uh, of the commission, there is the title tech sovereignty which is a, ref a reflection of the ideas we put forward in the Global Trends uh, Report. And a role will be to spur innovation in a way that serves Europeans well. That raises the question of how we can ensure that the EU regulatory framework incentivizes innovation, acts as an enabler for other aspects such as access to capital, a skilled workforce, or support for scaling up promising innovative technologies. You will have seen also that there is a debate going on uh, at European level on the sort of depth and intensity of legislating. Um, there is a debate about simplification of legislation, of administrative burden, reporting obligations, versus the need to keep abreast with technological developments uh, with a, an agile and efficient EU legislation. So the strategic choices may look daunting but we should not forget that the European Union, together with the member states, has the ability and the tools to affect change and turn challenges into opportunities. It's clear that we will need to draw deeply on those in the years to come. The report makes clear that the more we understand the complex challenges ahead, and in particular the interconnections between the different areas I've mentioned, the better and sooner we can anticipate, prepare and act. In a nutshell, that's uh, the element of tech in, in our global trends reports, and I'm looking for, for the debate. Thank you. Pascal, thank you very much. It's often good to ask a follow-up question, but my head is spinning with the number of issues that, that you've raised, and as you said at the end, the, how interconnected they are. So perhaps we'll move straight along to our next speaker who joins us here, uh, Peter Clifford, who's Head of Strategy at Research Ireland. Thank you, Dan. Great to be here, thanks for the opportunity. So Research Ireland is Ireland's largest competitive research funder. We fund research and innovation to create a better future. You may not know us because we're only about three months old, two months old. We were founded based on an amalgamation of Science Foundation Ireland and the Irish Research Council. So we're talking about strategic foresight. Why do funders do strategic foresight? From our perspective, research funders meet economic needs and other needs. So if we're going to do that, we need to know what those economic needs are. We need to know what those other societal, environmental, cultural needs are also. 
Um, the time frame is quite tricky for a research funder. Uh, we're, we're quite slow, I must be honest. By the time we run a program, make awards and train, do the research, and then the, re the researchers and the knowledge comes out the far end, it can easily be seven to 10 years. So we are, as was said previously, we are quite thinking quite far into the future when we do this. So that makes it hard. The, the time frame makes it hard. The globalized nature of the modern economies makes it hard. And the globalized nature of research and innovation makes it hard. So how do we sort of make it a tenable problem? We focus in, or we would like to focus in, a lot of what I'm saying is preliminary. I'm not authorized to say what I'm saying. We're, we're getting our strategy organized. Uh, we zero in on why would we do this piece of research in Ireland? What's unique about Ireland that makes this research particularly relevant? It could be geographical, could be economic, could be geopolitical, et cetera, as we've heard already. So what's some good examples? The offshore, offshore wind agenda is a perfect example of why we have a natural advantage there with our, our ocean possessions. So how do we approach this in Research Ireland? This is our ambition. We're not doing it yet, but we, we know we need to partner the, Glo the National Research and Innovation System. We're just one player in that. So as we do foresighting and horizon scanning, we've got to partner with Enterprise Ireland, IDA, our parent department of further and higher education, research, innovation and science. These colleagues are all in the room, so we will certainly be doing this with them. The, the great news, the really good news, is that the researchers themselves are making good progress as to how to do strategic foresighting. So just one example, we're working with Professor Dieter Kogler out in UCD, and he studies how research, or how knowledge, knowledge excuse me, evolves. And having learned how knowledge evolves, he's able to predict how current knowledge will evolve and hence give on a national level, so tailored to Ireland, he can predict emerging areas of innovation and research that could be beneficial for Ireland. So hopefully a fruitful collaboration there. Um, finally, this was mentioned at the lunch, so apologies to the, to the lunchers, but it'd be remiss of me not to state the importance of having a broad base of capacity, capability, and excellence, research excellence in the country. So we can, we can pick, so I'll stop gesturing, annoying the mic, we can pick strategic verticals uh, through our foresighting and horizon scanning. We'll get some of them right, but some of them will be wrong. We need that broad base to provide that resilience and that, you know, that protection for when we get it wrong. And what's the best example of this? It was the COVID pandemic. So the vaccines came from mRNA research that initially didn't get recognized as really impactful scientifically. So that's, again, an example. We need to fund research that we don't know the impact of it. And then even in Ireland, when we were responding to the pandemic, we had the statistical modelers, we had the epidemiologists, you know, this all relied on having funded that broad base of capacity and excellence in the country before that. So I'll stop there with that vision of strategic verticals and a, and a broad base, and that's a strategic foresight from a research perspective. Good. Uh, thank you, Peter. So we'll go to our next speaker who's joining us online. Uh, Elena Lazarou is a senior analyst at the European Parliamentary Research Service. Elena, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, and thank you very much for having me with you online. I'm sorry I can't be in Dublin, which is one of my favorite cities. Um, and um, and it's very interesting to join a discussion where we have parts of the EU institutional mechanism, but also, you know, the Irish perspective and, and the R&D perspective. Now, um, my role here is is to go a bit beyond the, the sort of practicalities of how foresight is done, because I have to say where I work in my service, we have a whole and very uh, tremendous unit working on, on foresight who are collaborate with Pascal Lardini in, in the context of ESPAS, our foresight unit. But I was asked to talk a bit about politics and security and how the foresight trends work 
to blend within that that environment of the changing nature of security, which is very important to to technology as well today. Um, and as uh, someone who's been tangentially involved in the Foresight Worker Parliament, what I wanted to do is talk a bit about, you know, the main trends we've been following in geopolitics and security for the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years, and what we are looking at going forward. And then I'll say two things about how I think technology now is part and parcel of all of them. Uh, so, but before I go into that, and I promise I won't take more than my four minutes that are remaining, just to say to, I think it's particularly, as Pascal Lardini said, very important that we are now discussing this as the new commission hearings are being held, because a very important work has entered the word has entered the lexicon, preparedness. Uh, we have two commissioners that have a portfolio that includes preparedness in their title. We have a report by former um, Finnish president Saul Ninisto on preparedness, readiness, and societal resilience. And these are all terms out of the um, encyclopedia of foresight. I mean, it includes, of course, the terms of strategic autonomy and resilience in the EU level. But all these terms, if you do military military studies and you look at how military foresight started, these are terms we have there. So I think the security and military transposition of wording into the foresight work and into other areas is showing us how this securitization trend that was foreseen uh, initially is really is really being part and parcel of all the areas uh, of, of foresight work that ESPAS is looking at. Now, briefly looking forward on the geopolitical landscape, you know, what trends have we been monitoring for the past years and what do we see coming up that I think will impact the public and the private sector equally, but also feeds into a lot of the legislation that is being proposed in various sides of the world, including the EU. I think one is understanding where the locus of power is and what kind of power we're talking about. And it's also part of the ESPAS work to note that power is being diffused in the international system. So we have power now focused or located not only in states, but we also have it in sub-state actors, in private actors, in local actors. So this means that you know things like diplomacy, but also technological innovations, they include all these networks of of, of actors. So that's one. Where is the power? The second is how do these actors cooperate between them? And there we're coming from a lot of trend work in the past 10, 15 years on multilateralism and the international system and global governance. And one big key question is, are we in a system where these actors are cooperating together in a structured way, as in the multilateralism that we have been working on, especially as it's part of the EU's values uh, for, for several decades, or are we witnessing a fragmentation of this international environment uh, and of the actors that have this power? And if so, how do we navigate um, this environment as the European Union and as member states of the European Union? How do you carry out diplomacy? How do you carry out international cooperation on AI, on climate, on security in an environment? So for this, we're trying to look at where, how is power being restructured and rediffused? Um, third, societal dynamics, democracy, autocracy, how are different types of elections and how are different types of societal de developments, including demographics, affecting the ways that politics are carried out in states um, and in sub-state uh, entities? And again, how does that in turn feed into international cooperation? But also, I know that you have a lot of people in the audience that are from the private sector. So what does this mean in terms of how the private sector gets involved? into various initiatives um, at the government level and how do states cooperate between them when we have several look different uh, sort of polarizations in, 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 in those areas. Uh, and fourth, and then I'll finish with this fourth, is a big cluster of things, which is the trend that includes trade and economic security and the direction in which, you know, um, how are global dynamics and global security dynamics being affected by the ways in which the you know the globalized and free trade is now being um either weaponized or 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 sort of polarized uh, or you know reconfigured where different state actors are looking at their own economic security when you know, the technology is making critical raw materials and supply chains a big part of security issues. So, you know, we're looking very much at how the trade, the trend towards open and free trade has now um, sort of fed into various 
actors' uh, strategies in, in using, um, weaponizing supply chains and economic security, and again, what the response is to that while maintaining uh, the EU's values and, and, and approach to, to, to the international system. So in all these areas I've mentioned, if you look at uh, the last 10, 15, 20 years, I would say, you know, foresight studies at the EU level, at the US level, at the World Economic Forum, other private actors, they've been looking at these trends and there is more idea that, and all of them have been telling us the story of everything becoming security for a while. You know, for a while we've been seeing the potential of, 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 of trade, of, of population movements, of climate, of energy to become, of health to become security issues. So the question I think is, um, how to utilize this to anticipate, prepare, and set the right policies and the right time frame in place so that these crises, when they arrive, can be, well, either to anticipate them and foresee how they can prevent it or how to have the mechanisms ready to, 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 to mitigate them. And I think their technology and innovation is critical. And as was mentioned, you know, we also have to criticize ourselves, uh, all of us, I think not this refers to everyone, but we also have to congratulate or at least be content that there are methods in place and, and mechanisms to face these things when they come. And I think the COVID example has been mentioned. It was a very good one. Uh, and I think right now, as Pascal Leradini said, you know, there is continuous movement to integrate in the EU level legislation mechanisms in which, you know, anticipatory governance can take into consideration these trends and feed into the way that the EU prepares itself uh, to counter or to deal with or to even leverage the trends in the way that is most uh, consistent with its values and its interests. Uh, so I'll stop here. I tried to pack a lot into five minutes, so I hope it made some sense, but I do, uh, I do look forward to the discussion. Thank you for, for that. And maybe just a question that arises from, from your um from your, your comments there, and I'd like to put it to all the panel, is, is the pace of change. It's often a sort of conference cliche. We've never lived in a time of such accelerating uh, change. But I'd just be interested to get the panel's views on, is that the case? Uh, is the pace of change twice what it was in the past, particularly in technological change? Is AI, AI really causing an acceleration, or is it more linear? Or, interested to get people's views on, on that so plenty of advance notice uh for uh for that question um our fourth speaker is kevin flynn who's the head of the irish liaison office for research and innovation in brussels for enterprise art thanks very much um so maybe just a word firstly um but enterprise ireland um i'm sure most of you know us we're uh the state's uh, development agency uh we work with over five thousand companies across all sectors um, and operate 39 offices globally um, to help companies achieve their growth plans. So this gives us a very kind of deep engagement and a deep understanding of the innovation challenges that is being faced by our client companies um, from, you know, very small kind of micro enterprises right the way up to, to, to startups, to uh, in, indigenous uh, multinationals and um, foreign direct investment multinationals as well. So it's a, quite a quite a broad um, view of the kind of the, the challenges they're facing and what we can do as a state um, to help them um, to innovate. So our activities directly support, uh, as I said, disruptive, deep tech spin outs, high potential startups, SME and scaling enterprises. And we're the largest funder of applied research and more kind of close to market research in Ireland. So with regard to um, my work um, in, in Brussels and Horizon um, Europe uh, specifically, we operate the uh, National Support Network. Um, this aims to secure as much Irish engagement as possible um, with this incredibly important um, European funding program. Uh, the network is made up of uh, national contact points. Um, who are individual experts in areas such as health, digital, uh, industry, space, climate, and so on. And the goal of the network is to build on Ireland's considerable track record um, in winning EU funding. So at the moment, we rank about 13th out of, 20, out of the 27 member states. And to date in this program, we've uh, about 812 million euro uh, drawn down. Uh, 231 million of this went to SMEs, which is obviously very important from our perspective as a, as a development agency. So with that, we have a success rate of about 20%, so essentially one in five um, 
eligible proposals from Ireland are retained for funding. And this is critical um, in, in terms of helping us to collaborate internationally and to be um, basically at the races when it comes to uh, scientific excellence internationally. Um, and it's part of our role to kind of build that bridge between industry and, and academia and new sources of knowledge, be it uh, domestically or in, uh, internationally. So from a development point of view um, and looking out to the future, uh, economically speaking, Ireland is obviously in a, in a re relatively good space at the moment, full labour market, positive G GDP growth, good, vibrant um, enterprise base. And we've a good, Ireland Inc. has a good reputation, uh, remains strong, um, uh, and it's very positive internationally, which is, which is all very good. However, when we think about R&D, um, while our investment is growing, our percentage, uh, um, our, as a relative uh, to our percentage of GDP, we're falling behind where we need to be. Finland, for example, commits up to 4% um, of GDP um, in, in R&D. And, you know, there, there's an open question as to whether or not we could do something similar. Um, also, our global innovation index score is also kind of trending in the wrong direction. So we're a tenth at the moment, and we can't afford to be left behind. It's a burning platform, um, and at a sector and client level, we're concerned. Some sectors in Ireland, such as food, which is a, a big, a very big sector, big employer, uh, we're behind the international benchmarks when it comes to R D and I. Without new enhanced products and services, staying competitive or even alive is going to be very, very challenging. Um, so we need to become more R&D intensive. So the first part of that is obviously what we can do to boost R&D and I capability in our companies. It's a well-known kind of market failure that not enough investment is, is going on internationally, um, but specifically within Ireland. So we have to maintain a strong focus in the future and navigating our way through many of the, the complex uh, geopolitical situations articulated today and the considerable market disruption um, and pace of technological advancements for today and tomorrow. So major challenges, major opportunities, and they all require RDNI solutions. The dual, and going, going to your question somewhat, that dual transition of decarbonization and digitalization happening at the same time is having serious consequences and it is a massive increase in terms of the pace of change. Then of course we've convergence of AI, biotech changes that will definitely impact um, existing sectors. And, and we need to make sure that our actions and investments support the environment without, without harming it. The other thing to consider as well, especially in the, from the Western world's point of view is that demographics are weighted towards the elderly. Um, so this is obviously presenting new opportunities when it comes to kind of personalized medicine and food. Um, and we're starting to look very seriously at what we can do in pre precision fermentation, for example, uh, to kind of augment our large uh, food industry. At the same time, automation, personalization, shaping sectors, and certainly will continue to, to do so in the future. So the businesses operating today will need to pivot very quickly. Um, and the startups emerging now and in the years ahead will need to be given all the support they can to scale quickly. And the comp competition will be fierce and the pace will be critical. So a very important part of our growth must be the continued investment in, in innovation. And the Draghi report gave us plenty to consider when it comes to European competitiveness um, and what Europe's position should be. Uh, China is investing at a, at, at a pace uh, and the US will continue to, to power ahead as usual. So it's necessary for the state to fund more, more research from the bottom up and we, we discussed that a little bit earlier on, that need for exploratory basic research right the way through high tier L commercialization. Um, and Research Ireland um, is leading the way on that activity and we value our, our collaborative relationship with them on that. But pushes, especially at, at, at European level now with, with Draghi and, and many of the conversations that's coming out of the, the, the commission, um, the, these pushes towards competitiveness, strategic autonomy at the European level represent challenges and opportunities for Ireland. Um, increased availability of U European funding, which is what people are talking about. Some people are even talking about doubling the budgets and so on. Um, that'll be positive, but it'll also require a scaled domestic research system that's capable of playing 
um, at that scale, at the new requisite scale, um, in much more ambitious demanding research calls in areas like AI, quantum computing, uh, semiconductor strategic autonomy, and so on. So at, at, at the same time, we have to consider um, that Ireland has been you know, a, a center for entrepreneurial activity. We'll continue to encourage um, a stronger national focus on entrepreneurship um, in order to motivate uh, more to establish startups who may become scaling companies of the future. Um, our vision is that new companies of scale will employ 10,000 plus and they'll have uh, globally competitive R&D and collaborative R&D capabilities. And the HEIs will be very important partners in that. Um, especially when you consider the skills that are required, the innovators, engineers, programmers, and language skills be absolutely critical to our companies and their ability to trade globally. Um, and the, these skills development needs to be baked in um, at all levels of the, of the public funding system. And of course, uh, from an R&D, EI perspective, deep tech spin outs, very important for us. And we have a target of achieving um, 30 per year um, as part of Impact 2030. So we, we need to do more in order to get there. Um, at the same time, that, that collaborative function is incredibly important, which I mentioned earlier on. And we believe that the research ecosystem needs to be more connected with, with enterprise. In recent years, we're getting around 2,000 engagements um, like at, at the kind of research project and engagement with, um, with centers and so on, uh, supported via EI per annum. We know that that engagement works um, and that companies who engage with it um, perform better, um, have as much as 4x the turnover of companies that don't in, in, engage in R&D and collaboration. So it really enables companies to achieve uh, the step change in their in-house capability to augment their existing capabilities um, and adapt to the, the changing world that's presented. So kind of our vision uh, for the future is kind of a, a, a collaborative kind of Team Ireland approach um, where we're more collaborative, focused and, and impactful. We'd like to be seen as the number one destination for starting, scaling business and, and kind, of, kind of to be a talent magnet um, for ambitious research um, researchers. But in order to do that, we have to prioritize collaboration. We have to prioritize scaling invest in innovation and entrepreneurship. And if we do, uh, the overall prize is vast and it will help to undoubtedly secure our future. So it's absolutely critical. Thank, uh, you, thank you, Kevin. Just <clears throat> a clarification, probably it was just me. You said one in five SMEs who make an application just elaborated it by probably was just distracted by trying to keep everything. Uh, that was beyond um, SMEs. That's that that's academic and SMEs. Um, it's across the board for, for, for the, Irish for applications. Irish applications to um, to Horizon Europe. Okay, one in five is successful. How does that compare with other countries? Do you have that? Uh, that we are among the best. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I said, overall, in terms of kind of, if, if, if you look at the numbers, we're about 13th out of the 27. Good. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing well, but again, can't, can't get complacent for a second. It's, it's a tough um, competition. Good. Thanks for that clarification. And last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, Una Fitzpatrick, uh, Director of, Tech, of Technology Ireland. Una. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I'm in the unenviable position of going last, so I don't know if I can actually add anything new. So what I might try and do is maybe respond to some of the points raised and I can try and give the Technology Ireland perspective. So Technology Ireland, we're a trade association within IBEC uh, representing technology companies, both large scale uh, FDI technology companies, as well as indigenous Irish technology companies. So both sides of the coin. And I suppose what's sometimes often missed with, with such a large sector here in Ireland is when it comes to employment numbers, actually 51% of all tech workers are employed in FDI and 49% of tech workers are employed in indigenous tech companies. So it's really kind of a really good stat in terms of actually it's a very balanced ecosystem from an employment perspective. Um, I think in terms of the topics that have been kind of brought up today, and we're talking about innovation, sovereignty, global influences, threats, risks, um, Irish influences, and I suppose most importantly, competitiveness. These have all been kind of central to a lot of the, the lobbying and advocacy work we've been doing lately, both ahead and um, kind of during the EU election and now obviously with, with, with the Irish general election. Um, I suppose in terms of the digital single market itself, it has undergone rapid development over the last couple of years, and especially on the regulatory front. Um, we have landmark regulations such as the AI Act, the Data Act, um, the Cyber Resilience Act, the revised EIDAS regulation, 
the revised AVMS Directive and the Digital Services Act, uh, just to name a few. Um, a number of those have caused many a grey hair for myself and for many of my members. So uh, I have felt the last five years keenly. Um, so implementation, I suppose, of these new initiatives, um, which have been hard fought and, 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 and uh, you know, worked on, is the important task. Um, and that's really, I suppose, our call and has been our call to this new, new European Commission is implement and assess. Please just implement and assess. Um, it has been a period of, of rapid regulation, which we, we fully support and industry recognises the need for. Um, but there are huge areas of overlap. There are still a lot of questions to be answered. We don't have full guidance yet on the AI Act. There is a lot of work to do to actually implement the current acts that have been announced. Um, and I suppose that's 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 really our call to action. Um, industry recognises the need to promote uh, development of responsible, fair and secure digitalisation in a stronger, more coherent digital single market as a driver for change, economic growth and well-being of Europe's industry, enterprise, consumers and citizens. Um, and I suppose I was really kind of heartened to hear we kind of the, the policy nerd in me watching Henna Verrucken's uh, kind of MEP um, questions on, on Tuesday night, you know, that she wants Europe to become an AI continent. Um, and I think that's really positive and we absolutely support that. But it can't happen without harmonised implementation of the AI Act. And harmonisation, I suppose, has been kind of key to, to a lot of what we've been talking about um, for, for a number of years now. And um, we can't just add more and more rules and yet still remain innovative. And we can't add more and more rules and have member states kind of applying them in different ways and then try and have a single digital market. It just won't work. Uh, the compliance burden is something we hear more and more from companies about. And it's the silent cost of compliance as well is really impacting on competitiveness. And I was heartened to see that referenced in the Draghi report. Um, so really, I suppose we want to create a true digital single market where companies can innovate and scale in critical technologies. Um, and I suppose some of the, the areas that we're, we're most focused on at the moment, and again, we're kind of having a lot of these discussions ahead of the Irish, Irish general election, is really Ireland leading in Europe. Um, and that means, you know, especially leading in tech policy, given the size and scale of the industry here, the types of companies we have, we have a very important role. We are our officials have important roles, our ministers have important roles, our regulators have hugely important roles. And we're really kind of calling that Ireland is first amongst equals on a, on a European basis um, because of the strength and depth of the industry here. And we understand that means more resources. Um, those big ministers, departments, uh, regulators need to be resourced to be able to, to, to drive that agenda. In terms of kind of the regulatory environment, um, you know, again, that, that consistent call around harmonised implementation, we can see from some of the manifestos coming out from parties at the moment, um, you know, some calls in terms of what they would like to do in the tech space. Our, our, our response to that is absolutely lead those calls at a European basis. Um, what we would anticipate or be kind of anxious or risk uh, that would face Ireland is Ireland doing any kind of solo runs uh, when it comes to the regulatory space um, with regard to the tech sector. Absolutely lead these discussions in Europe, be that be that voice in Europe, um, but please don't go on a, on a solo run that diverges um, our, our, our regulatory space from the rest of Europe. Um, obviously, then supports for entrepreneurial activity, you know, huge amount of, of, of companies um, in the startup scale up space that, that we are working with. Um, again, it's the red tape piece. And I know we've talked about some of the um, funding applications. How can we make that easier? And I know Enterprise Ireland do great work there. Is there even more that we can do to incentivize companies to um, apply for more funding? On sustainability and I suppose energy, um, I suppose a huge aspect of, of the discussions lately have been around AI. AI is energy intensive. Ireland has a great opportunity and um, we do have a strong base of, of data centres here. We, uh, for, for enviable reasons, we have the right climate for them. Um, and we also have the ability, if we can get our house in order, um, to accelerate the development of offshore wind and actually be an energy exporter or an energy, um, have an energy surplus. Um, so we could, we could really make um, Ireland, you know, very strategic um, from, a, from a tech and energy perspective. Um, but understanding that will require a lot of joined up thinking, a lot of work to, um, across many different departments in many different areas, but it's something from the tech sector that we fully support. 
and are actually commissioning research on it right now in terms of what is actually needed to get us there. On new technologies in AI, um, I suppose this is a broader kind of European conversation and I suppose the phrase that sticks with me is, are we price makers or are we price takers? And I think that's a question, you know, with regard to the AI Act and in terms of its implementation, um, we can see the US and China powering ahead here. So Europe has an opportunity to be a price maker, but it also, if it doesn't move swiftly and if it kind of falls behind and if we're not aggressive enough, we will be price takers. And what will that mean? And again, that all comes back then into the whole sovereignty and maybe competitiveness piece. And linked to that then is skills. And we're obviously very passionate about the need to develop more uh, and attract more skills into the country. So I'm very conscious I'm probably running over on time, um, but those are just some of the, the high level areas I said I'd respond to. Thank you, Anna. Great. Look, we've got half an hour <clears throat> to go through questions. Uh, the usual uh, format here, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, if you could just raise your hand, a microphone will come to you. And if you could identify yourself and put your question uh, or questions. Uh, also, people online are free to put their questions uh, via the Q&A Zoom function. So I'll be keeping an eye out uh, for any hands that are going up. Uh, but maybe that, that, that question about the, 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 the measuring the pace of change and maybe we'll go in reverse order una i don't want to put you on the spot it's a big question maybe just maybe a minute each if you could just give what, what your views on that and it'd be interesting to see how different views are on, on on the question yes it's definitely in time of increased change however i would say the change that maybe we and in europe are, are looking at is the regulatory change and in other regions, they're focused on technological change. And that's where the different exponentials are happening. So we're exponentially regulating and maybe they're exponentially uh, developing technology. Now, it's not to say that both can't happen at the same time, um, but I do think it's linked to that. It's, it is a race um, on, on some of these technologies and other regions are racing ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, reverse order, yeah. Um, I, I, I think the... the uh, we haven't seen a pace like we have today. Um, I, I think uh, certainly there's been revolutionary technologies over the years, um, but I think what makes our current time different is the convergence of, of technologies in a lot of senses. So if you think about Industry 4.0, Industry 5.0, it's, it's, it's not one technology, it's, mm. it's several very, very vastly different technologies from um, rapid prototyping to AI to automation. And actually, the, the the fusion of these very difficult to understand. If you're if if you're in the manufacturing space, where you start, how how you actually bundle these together to achieve um, effective impacts in your in your business. So that kind of convergence, put together with you know broader digitalization in the system, put together with the greening agenda, there is a lot of um, a lot that's pushing. Um, uh, the pace of change forward. Um, and it's certainly something we haven't seen in, in many years. Okay, Elena. Yes, so so I think time time is very important, but it needs a SWOT analysis. So I think when you do the, the calculus of how fast you are, uh, you have to also measure in, and that's where foresight is again, very important. How will when you do something and how fast you do it impact, you know, the, the society, the geopolitical dynamics, security, will it have, you know, negative effects on parts of society? So, I mean, it, it's all things one has to factor in. I work in the field security and defense where the pace of technological innovation, you know, if you have innovation in five years, that's really fast in security and defense. Uh, so I think short planning for the short term, middle term and long term, measuring the energy climate, societal, uh, geopolitical, and, and, and uh, other impacts uh, comes into play. Uh, and, and of course, speed is of the essence with the type of threats we have now. Importantly, legislation has to be passed in, a, in an efficient and, and timely manner as well, and maybe to foresee that it is applicable also and it doesn't become obsolete by the time of implementation. That's also very important. Uh, so I think you take all this into consideration, uh, of course, Efficiency is of the essence at these times, but and, and timely and the speed. But I think it needs this kind of analysis. If I may use abuse the fact that I am speaking, just to say one point to the 
to the takers or, or, or you know, buyers or sellers on the AI, I just want to bring in something important also that Foresight monitors, which is AI legislation in places we haven't mentioned, like Brazil, like Mexico, they're actually following very much the EU sort of example. And I think it's important to take this into account. And again, this fades into the, the polarizations, the power balance and, and, and the global dynamics conversation. Thank you, Peter. I don't have a good answer to your exact question. I'm going to answer a slightly different question, if you'll allow me. The pace of change of research and turning that research into innovation. So, of course, there are an ever-increasing number of research publications published every year, and I'm not even counting the ones written by AI. Say no more about that. But in terms of stretching the boundary of research and turning that into innovation, in a sense, we're victims of our own success. We've achieved so much that making further progress is getting more and more incremental. Right. So how do I know this? We're getting rapidly into the territory of research on research or meta-science. People in academia study research and research becoming innovation and the process of that and how hard it is and so on. So I can provide pointers people who are interested. And just pat pat patenting, exactly. is, is, that a, is that a measure of acceleration? I, I don't have the numbers to hand, global patenting. There's a, an office at Geneva, I think. Do, do, do you know if those numbers suggest an acceleration in, in, in it, patenting? It's all connected. I think patents are accelerating, and I think patents coming from research are maybe less so, again, because of that thing I said about okay. victims of its own success. There were people in the past that thought we had discovered everything. They were luckily proven horribly wrong, uh, but but we're we're sort of getting to that point again where we do have to, you know, and it, it comes back to uh, the point was made already about levels of investment. It's getting harder and harder to stretch the boundary, so that corresponds to more and more investment, unfortunately. Okay, good. And Pascal, last uh, last word on this sort of broader philosophical yes. point to you. Yes, I would very much agree that the, the, the issue is not so much the pace of change, but the sort of the cross effect of the changes. Uh, when you take the example of biotech 25 years ago, when we legislating on biotechnology at the European level, it concerned basically two or three sectors, pharma, chemicals, and maybe a few others. With AI, it's completely different. It's not just one sector, it's all sectors. So which begs a lot of very strategic questions for the regulators. One is, how best to regulate, whether it's through a sort of horizontal act, we have the AI act, but now we have to see the consequences of AI everywhere, in transport, in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, consumer protection, everywhere. So it begs a lot of questions about how to regulate. And the second question is about the type of, re of, of leg regulation and legislation we should put forward, because I'm very attentive to what you say about the competitiveness place of Europe in the world. So far, our norm setting powers have been seen as an advantage because we're, we were often the fast movers, but we need to regain this regulatory advantage on the world scale. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you want to come in? If I could just um, kind of def define the pace of change in a slightly different way and just frame it from the perspective of, of an SME, for example, that's, we'll, we'll say potentially in the manufacturing space. Um, if you think about it in terms of if they do not engage um, recent technological advancements, if they are not green, if they are not digital, if they are not automating, where are they going to be in the next couple of years? If you think about that in terms of a framing device for time and, and the consequences of doing nothing, it kind of highlights how quickly um, certainly industry need to act. And do small companies have the capacity to get their heads around all this stuff? Well, it, it's it's an extreme challenge, and that that's why we have supports in place to help them do that. We have uh, we fund um, research centers across the state in order to actually take some of that heavy lifting mm. out, in order to help them to kind of navigate the kind of options that are available, the, the kind of equipment, de-risking that as much as possible, in order to help them make sensible choices and do it in an incremental way, because they can't just kind of wipe everything out overnight and start again. So how do they plug and play these new technologies mm. in order to make advancements quickly, but in a kind of stepped uh, response as well, where, where they don't have the capital to do it? Thank you all for that. So Dennis Nocton, uh, first question for our, uh, for our colleagues uh, in uh, online, former parliamentarian and minister, uh, Dennis. Thanks, Dan. And just for the two speakers online, I'm a former digital and energy uh, minister, and I want to come to this issue. Every one of you have touched on the issue 
of, of digital AI quantum and balancing that against uh, decarbonization. And the big bottleneck, and Una touched on it, is the issue of energy. We're in a net deficit across Europe in terms uh, of energy. If we don't have the energy, we cannot develop this sector. It's as simple as that. And at the moment, we have a very piecemeal grid across Europe. We have a very piecemeal approach in ter terms of the deployment of renewable energy. So how are we going to overcome that? If we're going to become the AI centre globally, we can only do it if we have access to energy and we don't have that to meet our current needs, never mind future needs. Uh, Pascal, would you like to, to comment on, on that or anyone else? First of all, yes, that's an issue which is very um, sort of known in, in, in Brussels at the European uh, informal European Council last week in Budapest, a couple of heads of state and government have raised the issue of the price of energy in particular. Um, and um, there is a, a demand from a number of member states to look at the sort of dissociation from the um, the price of, of electricity from the, the, the from the price of gas. Because that's you know the way it is constructed and, uh, under EU legislation. So this is something we are looking into. There is very delicate, very complicated, but that's an, an issue which is on the agenda. Um, and I think the, the, the other one is that there are tools at European level, like the Connecting Europe facility, which, with its limited means, it's not uh, uh, in unlimited funding, but we try to. Uh, fund the missing links in terms of transport, uh, energy, and, and digital connections between between member states. And I think Ireland can benefit from that as well. Okay. Anyone else to, on the data center? Una? Yeah. I suppose, like, I think from, from our perspective, it's just we need to develop our grid. Um, it has been wholly underinvested in for, for many years. And now really is the time. I think we have great ambition, I think, for... You know, huge volume of offshore wind by 2030, but we're almost in 2025 and very little of that groundwork has actually started. So we'd be quite concerned about not meeting our own targets. Um, and I think you can see maybe member states who have an advantage, be it like France, um, obviously with nuclear, and um, we can see the UK um, putting a lot of big bets behind AI and again, kind of differing um, energy sources that they have. So I think the AI and energy piece are going to be inextricably linked um, and that if we want to be both an AI continent, but also Ireland as an a be an AI leader, um, the energy piece will have to be central to the discussion. Okay, I think it'll, not based on, I'm no expert in the whole energy field, but solar, wind, battery, small modular reactors. Is it possible that in 10, 15 years, we could have more or less solved the clean energy problem. Is anybody that optimistic of those of you who look into it? Or do you think 10 or 15 years we're, we're still going to have the climate related problems because of we haven't shifted out, out of fossil fuels? Or is there a much more optimistic, clean, cheap energy future ahead of us? I'm optimistic if we can get the investment right. And I also think technology itself, and I know we were talking earlier about photonics, um, you know, there's huge development happening in terms of kind of both early stage research and slightly more developed research in terms of both from a drive perspective, you know, using half the amount of energy that previous um, racks would have, you know, that again will all accelerate um, both the adoption of AI, but also reduce the consumption of energy. So, but both things will need to happen in tandem. Um, and Peter, do you, with your sort of foresighting and your colleague in University College Dublin, do you, do you have any thoughts on Sure. So for us, I think it's a balance. And of course, there's there's already discussions happening around in the future. We've got offshore renewable energy coming in from our, our acres and acres of ocean. What do we do with the extra electrons? How do we make use of them? And what do we do with our economy almost turning into Iceland, which I think has been smelting aluminium, if I'm correct, for a number of years because they've had cheaper access to energy. So there's there's that. What can we do with the energy? Once we have it, there's getting there, as you said, Una, the precious five years. And then earlier we mentioned the critical raw materials. So, you know, we are we'll certainly optimistic that we'll have a much more renewable energy future. But then that starts eating into the critical raw materials. And these these devices all have lifespans, you know, recycling the carbon fiber veins of the windmills is not clear. So, you know, there's it's always a balance. Okay. Well, one thing I'd be very optimistic about, and business and entrepreneurs will find a use for clean energy. That's pretty much guaranteed. Another question from the floor. Thank you, Dan. Una O'Dwyer, member of the Institute and former colleague of Pascal Lehardini. Hi, Pascal. Uh, 
One of the speakers spoke about the uh, limited resources in the EU budget, and the other Una there on the platform mentioned the tension between regulation and innovation. Uh, Pascal mentioned uh, the limited resources for investment. Uh, it, it seems to me the EU is good at regulation, it has that reputation, but that doesn't cost anything like as much as innovation, and there's a very limited budget. I was wondering what the chances are we might indeed get an increase in the budget in the over the coming years, perhaps in the context of the next multi-annual financial framework, from a 1% EU to a, at least a 2% EU, if possible, because that's that's essentially what we are. Or is it going to have to be left to the private sector again to ensure any innovation? Pas Pascal, maybe, do, is that directed at anyone in particular? But Pascal, I think you might be particularly well positioned on that one. Thank, thank you. Uh, hi, Una. Nice to see you. Um, I've been doing uh, three different uh, multi-annual financial framework. And frankly, the chances to move from 1% GDP to 2% to are nil, zero. So we'll have to do more or less with what we have. I'm not saying that the research budget will not increase, but it will not double. And I think where I'm getting at is that we much ensure much greater synergy between the national research budget and the European research budget, which is Horizon Europe. I think now we have two parallel tracks, which try more or less to be aligned with the European research area. But I think we can do probably much, much more. In the Draghi report, he suggested two further avenues. One is to mobilize the private, uh, the private savings, which are huge in Europe, but do not benefit the European economy. So we need to have incentives there for the private uh, savings to invest in, in research and innovation and new technologies. And the other one is new financial instruments. I mean, we're working with the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg to develop blending between uh, the European programs, which are based on grants, with other techniques like uh, guarantees or, or loans from the EIB to uh, increase the firepower of, of, of Europe. Uh, Elena, could I go to, uh, in, in terms of how parliamentarians <clears throat> have shifted their view since the invasion of Ukraine, uh, how much the security and defence uh, issue has risen up the agenda. If you could just share some insights on that, and just if I could plug at four o'clock today, there's a member only members only uh, a webinar. Uh, we have speakers from Warsaw, Copenhagen, and two from Ireland on the implications for Euro European security and defense of the elections in the US last week. So those of you who are not aware of that and have time may wish to join at four o'clock. But uh, Elena, over to you. Thank you. Well, I think that that fits in quite well. Again, of course, we're talking about R&D defense in my case, but just to say that the, much before the, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, the, your, the parliament had been, I would think, a front runner in arguing that, you know, there should be uh, EU financing for defense research and particularly for dual use research, which is a way in which, you know, AI and digital also in civilian, in the civilian sector is supported, but also uh, possible to use for military and civilian uh, purposes. And we've had, you know, since 2017 and that the multi-annual financial framework of that, that time, preparatory actions for defense research, pilot programs for R&D in, in defense, then the European Defense Fund. But obviously, after the the, 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 the unjustified invasion of Ukraine and, and the, the need to step up European defense, there has been, and I wouldn't say it's just the parliament, I think the commission itself, the EAS, the whole EU ecosystem that supports defense research, the European Defense Agency have been really, um, you know, uh, working at we were talking about time before unprecedented pace to to put more financing into uh, defense uh, innovation and investment so has the european investment bank hand in hand even with the nato innovation fund so i think there's a lot of move to invest heavily uh, at the at the eu level in supporting and spearheading uh, defense and particularly dual use R&D. Uh, and that brings in and plugs in all the AI ecosystem uh, and all the sort of um, chips, uh, comms, um, various types of technologies into it. Uh, now, of course, I think uh, it's all the speakers have alluded to it. Uh, 
the majority of these initiatives, they work on the basis of um, sort of supporting collaboration, seed money, um, uh, support from the EU that offputs the extra costs of collaboration, um, incentives. But I think, you know, the, 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 the premise of public private cooperation and financing of leveraging investment on the private markets um, that's still there um, but uh, and it continues to to get a lot of support of obviously you've seen in a number of the hearings but also in the parliament's annual report on the csdp the call to support the european defense fund with more financing in the next multi-annual financial framework which makes sense in the context that we are in uh, but also and this is very important i think geopolitically when we look at what other actors in the world are doing and the degree to which you know china and russia and uh, saudi arabia india the united states are investing in increasing the percentage of defense spending that they are putting for defense r d and dual use r d so all of that is there in the space strategy and in the space in the financing for space uh, uh for so the space strategy there is also funds that can be used both for defense and civilian purposes and uh, to, for innovation and R&D. So I think, yes, that all of that has been there, but it's taken on new momentum, I would say, uh, with, with the geopolitical situation. Uh, and just to add on the energy conversation that there was before, I think it's important to remember the geopolitical dimension of that as well, and that the third pillar of the Repower EU is actually the external dimension of it. So when we talk about CRMs and about, you know, blue hydrogen, Hydrogen and other types of energy efficiencies that can be gained. That kind of work is, which is also being carried out by the EU, the agreements, including, I don't know, Chile for, for hydrogen or other parts of the like-minded world is also a way in which, you know, the energy dimension can be supported. It leverages partnerships that can then be also markets for EU EU uh, technologies. And also it, uh, it, it binds the geopolitical alliances with a number of actors that are strategically identified by the EU as important actors when we talk about the possible bifurcation of the geopolitical environment. So on the energy dimension, I just also wanted to add, there is also that external cooperation uh, through the external energy platform and other types of agreements. Um, okay, thank you. And Pascal, in, in terms of the, the, the pace at which Europe is rearming, um, do you think it's it's, sufficient what role is there for the European Commission that we've now got a defense commissioner for the first time but what role will the defense commissioner play in coordinating uh, European rearmament uh, uh, yes um, you know that we have we have limitations under the treaties we cannot really be in sort of the active defense discussion this is for the member states and exclusively for the member states so basically what uh, what we have uh, in mind is one is the regulatory environment for military equipment because now we have different rules in different member states, different standards, nothing is compatible between the different armies of, of Europe. The second one is public procurement. We have spe specific rules for procuring uh, armaments and related equipments, and we have to see whether we really use the potential of these pieces of legislation. And the third one is research and innovation for, in particular, dual-use products and, 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 and things like that. Thank you. Any of our uh, Irish panelists here want to comment on, on that whole trend, uh, what Ireland's involvement, what its not involvement, how companies here are involved in it, not involved in the dual use issue? Kevin? Um, I think I think when we talk about the the, the pace of um, of change that we require in that space, I, mean, I think it's pretty, pretty significant. Um, the, the funding opportunities um, from a European perspective are going to be very high. So we, we can no longer, I think, stand back and, and, and not play in the space. I think we need to be very clear about what we can and cannot do. Uh, there was a question there about the, um, whether or not we as Europeans are moving quickly enough. And I, I, I think the answer is clearly not. Um, and, and certainly when we think about Russia and it's essentially... Its its economy is now on a wartime footing. You know, it is it is based around its it, its ability to uh, uh, combat Ukraine, and while that's not working particularly well at the moment, nevertheless, that's the 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 position it's in at the moment, and that is far faster than than anything we are doing at European level. Okay, either it's not so much linked on defense, but I suppose it, it comes down to it. I suppose um, 
one area that Ireland hasn't kind of adopted or hasn't signed up to is around European investigatory orders. Um, so the EIO, and this is something we're quite concerned about as it, from an industry perspective, because it all links back to being able to fully implement the evidence directive. Um, and I suppose given the number of both large scale, but just tech companies who are based here, um, we will need to be in compliance with that um, directive. Um, and I suppose it's the way in which, I suppose, from a criminal and defense perspective, um, information can be shared between um, companies and um, be it the police in, in various member states. Um, and, you know, event, there is the potential that a company who is based here could get a, a requirement to share information with you know, the German police force and they will be required to do so. But because we don't have the laws in place here, they wouldn't be able to give that information to the Irish police. Um, so this is something we're, we're working with government on in terms of their and the Department of Justice are aware of it and we're looking. It, it would require changes potentially around our data retention laws. Uh, but it's just, I suppose, an example where at a national level, our own laws have to kind of keep up with um, the issues that are happening in Europe um, and make sure that we can both be a part of the wider ecosystem in some of those discussions. I'm not asking you to, we, we've got very few little time, but if you have an urgent thought on it. No, ju just on the defence, I think other other company, other countries are st have started to be more strict about collaborations with third countries, if you will, third country partners. Mm -hmm. And there's there's pressure on us in Ireland to to move closer to that, to okay. a more defense. Interesting. Question from the floor. Uh, uh, two questions, actually. Uh, like Declan DC, uh, former official European Union uh, Commission. Uh, to the panel, first of all, uh, you talk about collaboration between the various organizations. But on a practical level, are there structures in place already to ensure that collaboration. For instance, do the senior management of Enterprise Ireland, Research Ireland, and the HEA meet regularly to discuss their joint approach to the various challenges that we have? Could I just keep it to that because we're almost out of time? Does one person want to take? Feel that. We meet at all levels, senior management, middle management, and operational levels regularly. Okay. Not with reports published. No, there's commercially sensitive reasons for not publishing the report. Transparency okay. might help. Yeah. Okay, can I get another one online? We've got a load of questions online. Paul Woods, the head of function, strategy, and foresight of the Central Bank of Ireland. Uh, what do you see as the most material emerging risks for a small open economy that faces a scale challenge? For instance, larger economies can offer state-funded access to cloud, i.e. China, or invest tens of billions in sovereign AI and computer infrastructure. But what are your biggest concerns? Relatedly, as we face into likely trade barrier headwinds, as something I'm surprised hasn't come up already, are there clear strategic options to better differentiate and safeguard Ireland's economic model for the longer term? Uh, Una, well, it's a lot there. Yeah, it's a lot there. Um, yeah, I think um, the possibility of, I suppose, trade wars, tariffs, um, and I suppose from my perspective that tech will get caught up in some of that. Um, it mightn't be necessarily directed initially at tech, but we've seen before things like tariffs on steel, tariffs on whiskey, and there's been knock on impacts then in terms of digital services and digital goods. Um, and yes, that would be um, quite a concern. Pascal, it, it, you're uh, the president of the commission, I think recently said that trade, transatlantic trade could decline by 40% if things were to go ahead. What's being proposed by the president-elect in the United States is the biggest protectionist measure since the Smoot-Hawley Act more than 100 years ago. It completely uh, puts what the uh, Trump administration did in its first term uh, as, a, as, a, as a minor thing compared to what's proposed. How worried are you about a breakdown in the transatlantic trading relationship? Uh, first of all, we hope that this will not happen like this and, and we do everything possible not to, to fall in that situation. This being said, I think we have equipped ourselves with instruments in the last mandate which did not exist previously, like the screening of foreign direct investments or the screening of state aids by third countries to their producers. Now we, and, and you've seen, you've, uh, you, you, you witnessed the fact that for the first time we will impose duties on electric cars coming from, from China. So I think it's a very delicate and fine line between maintaining uh, as much as possible open borders and the free 
uh, trade system with the reaction of our, our trading partners. I mean, the Commission has been equipping itself with different options and tools. This is part of foresight work. And there has been a discussion at the European leaders uh, last week in Budapest during their informal European Council. One part of the discussion was about this particular topic. Thank you. And thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, apologies to the questions online that we couldn't come to, but we've run out of time. Uh, so again, uh, a very rich, uh, almost a cliched term, but a lot of, lot of material there. I hope everyone benefited from and will benefit from uh, in their work. Again, thanks to all the speakers and uh, thanks to all the attendees as well. Thank you.